Well, Brittany and Andrea, and their mom and dad too if they're listening, today's the 15th of September, 1990, and I'm going to start another side of this tape with some stories and things for you to listen to before you go to bed. And maybe if your mom says so, you could even listen to them sometime in the afternoon. The first story I got really isn't a kid's story. It's a story about your mom's uncle Leo and, and, and me, Grandpa, when we were little. And we lived up in that same big house where all the snow was, where we went Christmas time. Remember last Christmas? When he, the house was a little bit different, and it wasn't quite as big, and it wasn't as warm either. And the place where Uncle Leo and I slept was pretty cold sometimes. And, and often when we went to bed, it wasn't too cold then, and we went to bed quickly and got under the covers, but in the night it got colder and colder like it does in Butte. And when we woke up in the morning, we might be nice and warm in our bed, but the room was real cold. So we had to run real quick out of that room and out of the kitchen before we put all our clothes on, because the kitchen was warm as that was where the fire was, and that's where Grandma Jordan cooked our food. Well, one morning, very cold morning, we were laying there and Grandma Jordan opened up the door and she said, Leo, Titty, time to get up. And then she closed the door quickly and went back in the kitchen. Leo kind of wheezed and said, You awake? And, and you could even see your breath in that room. It was so darn cold. And I said, yeah, I was younger than Leo, and so I always thought he knew everything. And when it gets real cold up, up in Butte, sometimes the telephone wires hum. And now that I'm grown up, I know that they hum because they get pulled together real tight and they vibrate. But I didn't know then, and I just said, hey, why do wires hum when it's cold? And he said, I think because they try to pull down the telephone pole. I bet it's 40 below again. Give me my clothes. And he said that, but fell asleep and closed his eyes, stayed right there in bed. And I, I was laying on my belly and I, I just kind of got up on my, my knees and elbows and raised myself up so I could peek through the window and, oh golly, there was Jack Frost had painted the windows. You probably never saw windows that were painted with little ice figures on them. But that's how it was, and it was a clear night, and there was some sun that was just coming up over the mountain. But when I got up, I let some cold air under the blanket, and Leo grabbed it back, and then I was kind of cold, but I, I stood up. I tried to open the window so I could see out, and past all of the frost, but it was really frozen and shut. And so I just used my thumbnail and I scraped and scraped and I cleared a little area about big enough for my eyeball to look through. And then I could see Butte out the window. Remember that big uh, apartment house we called the Hilltop House? It wasn't built yet then. And you could see right out of that window where my bedroom was. And you could see Butte all sitting there in a bunch of cold smoke. And sun shining off the snow because remember the sun was very low in the in the sky in fact the sun was so bright that it made my eyes water and i thought when i looked out i'll have to take a close look at that telephone pole as i go to school and, and see if the wires are are causing it to bend and then the door got open again. This time it was Uncle Harry. He was even older than Leo. And he said, Get up! And he slammed the door and Leo hollered, Give me my clothes! Our clothes were laid all over the floor because that's what he used to throw it when we went to bed. Some of it was on a chair, just an old kind of green chair that we had. The reason that our clothes were laying all over the floor and some of it on the chair was because we used to 
jump in bed with our clothes on. And we'd undress while we were under the covers and, and throw our clothes at the chair. But we didn't always hit. We didn't mind if they were on the floor. Anyway, I got out of bed and I crawled toward where my clothes were. And when I was out of bed, I could smell some really nice, clean air, because that's the way that cold air is in the winter. And besides that smell of clean air, I could smell coffee cooking in the kitchen, and, and bacon was frying. And boy, those two things together really smell good. I, I moved toward the chair, and I started grabbing Leo's clothes and throwing them to him. And then I touched one of Leo's socks. Well, you never smelled anything as bad as Uncle Leo's stockings. Because his feet smelled real bad too. And that's what made his stockings smell bad. And once I got close to his stockings, I couldn't smell that clean air. I couldn't smell the bacon or the coffee. And so I dropped the stockings and I grabbed on my undershirt, and my pants, and my shirt, and my shoes, and my socks, and I ran in the kitchen, partly to get out of the cold, but mostly to get out of the way of Leo's stockings, because they bit at my nose worse than the cold air did. One night, in a place kind of like Florida, it was cloudy and rainy and there was a thunderstorm and a bolt of lightning came flying down from a cloud and it touched the earth just for an instant and then it disappeared. But a little green man from outer space was riding on that bolt of lightning and when it hit and then it left, it left him sitting on the wet grass and he was kind of dazed but after a moment or two, he, he stood up and with one of his arms, he kind of braced himself against the tree and, and he used two of his arms to steady some, some feelers he had on his head. And he had another arm besides, but it was just kind of hanging motionless at his side. And this little man thought, I wonder what kind of place this is. He'd been flying around through the stars and and he stopped to rest on a fluffy cloud, and that was the cloud that the thunder and lightning came out of it. It was just all of a sudden the cloud started to kind of boil, and, and he was carried down with that bowl of lightning, and boy, he was shaken back and forth, and a terrible wind threw him upward, and then the lightning bolt carried him down to the ground. And he thought, I should learn more about this funny place. He said, he didn't say it like I say it, because he talked kind of a funny language, being from outer space and everything. Well, he, he could kind of fly. He had some jets of air that came right out of the bottoms of his legs. And he turned them on, and they raised him up above the grass. And when all eight of his legs were in the air, he bent his knees a little bit, and then he could fly very quietly, just a few feet above the ground. It was a very, very dark night, because you couldn't see the stars. And the only time there was any light was, was when there was lightning. But it didn't bother that little green man because he, those little feelers I told you about, they sent him signals that told him where things were going, so he never bumped into anything. And pretty soon he came to a big, high stone fence. And he thought to himself, well, the people that live on this planet must be on the other side. And, and I better not just fly over it. That would be kind of rude. I'll see if I can find a door. And so he went alongside the wall, and pretty soon he reached a great big iron gate, and the gate had an arch spread across it from one side to the other, and it was written on there, amusement park. So the little man reached in his coat, and he took out his notebook, and he wrote amusement park and some other words on it, and then he put it back flew through the bars, because they were far apart, and he was small enough to go right between them. And 
there was a path, and he followed the path, and pretty soon he came to a place where there were a whole bunch of paths that came together. And the paths had a whole bunch of signs on them and kind of arrows pointing to different places. And they said things like concessions, restroom, deer farm, birds, monkeys. One of them said, please do not litter. But it didn't point in any direction. He copied all of the words from the signs in his notebook, and then he drifted off in the direction of the sign that said birds. The birds were kept in very large cages, and, and the, the cages were covered with screens so the birds couldn't get away. And most of them were sleeping, and there were a few kind of rustling around, but they didn't pay any attention to the little man floating on the path. One of the cages had a, a tree in it, and on one of its branches there was an owl perched. And underneath the owl, there was a parrot hanging on a trapeze. It looked like the owl was asleep, but the parrot looked at the little man and squawked, <coughs> Howdy, stranger! The owl opened one eye and said, Who? And the parrot repeated, Stranger! Stranger! And so the little man wrote this very fast in his notebook. He was excited and interested in everything that went on. And he tried to describe what these creatures looked like because he'd never seen anything like them. And he also tried to write down the sounds that they made. But it started to rain kind of hard and his paper was getting wet. So he put the book away and thought, maybe I can talk to some of these funny earthlings. So he had to talk in his own language, but he imitated the, the, same, the pitch of the parrot's voice, and he said, Take me to your leader. And the owl said, Who? And the parrot shouted, Stranger! Stranger! And then some of the bigger birds in the cage woke up, and, and they started making a lot of no noise, and noise, and that even wakened other birds, and pretty soon there was all kinds of birds beating their wings and calling and flying up out inside the cages and everything, and far off, a dog started to bark, and that was a scary noise, and the little man turned around, and he saw a light moving toward him, and then he was kind of scared with all of that noise, and now there was all kinds of activity, so he flew up into a high tree, and he crouched among the leaves and branches, and he hoped that he wouldn't be seen by whatever that barking thing in the distance was. Of course, we know it was just a dog. And he focused his feelers toward the approaching light. The little man didn't know it, but the light was a flashlight, and it was carried by the night watchman in that amusement park. And the watchman was kind of in a grouchy mood because of all that noise. And he had to leave his nice dry office to go out and see what was bothering all those birds. And so he was walking pretty fast down the path and, and very angry. And, and he had a flashlight in his hand, like I said. And he had a, an umbrella in his left hand. And he also, with the same hand that he carried the umbrella in, he had a leash that held that dog that was barking and bouncing up and down and pulling the, the watchman and his umbrella back and forth. And the guy hollered, watchman hollered, Pipe down, you birds! And he shined the flashlight around the bird cage. And he said, A little thunder and lightning never hurt anything. And pretty soon, seeing the watchman there and everything, the birds settled down. But not the dog. The dog tugged the man toward the direction of the tree that the little green man was hidden in. And then he pulled so hard that the watchman had to follow him. And then the dog put his, his forelegs on the trunk, and, and boy, he was a big dog. He was almost as big as the watchman. And the poor man from outer space was crouched up among the branches, just so afraid that he might be seen. But the watchman couldn't see him because the umbrella was in the way. And whenever he moved the umbrella, the rain fell on his face, and he wore eyeglasses. And 
if the rain fell on his eyeglasses, he couldn't see through them either. So he didn't look up, tried very hard to look up in the tree. He said, oh, that's probably just a squirrel. And he turned and he pulled the dog with him and finally got the dog to go back to the office. And so the dog kept on barking. And the barking got quieter and quieter as the dog got further away. And the little man said, boy, I've seen enough of this stupid planet. I'm getting out of here. And so he started the jets on his feet going again and boom, he rose up into the heavens and he kept on going till he got to a little asteroid out in space between Mars and Jupiter. And he stopped for a while to rest and he took out his notebook and he drew a sketch and it showed our solar system, the sun and the planets. And then on the third planet, uh, he drew an arrow toward it and at the end of the arrow he wrote, the inhabitants of this place call it amusement park. The sky is filled with electricity and water. Most of the people can fly, but they have a horrible leader who keeps them in cages. He's called Stranger. He has only two legs, but he uses a noisy and frightening animal with four legs to pull him around. He has one arm with a bright eye at the end of it, and another with a huge hand that he uses to keep the water from falling on him. It's a terrible place, and folks from our planet could never live there. In many countries, kids have stories about things like Santa's Elf Man and and other small elves, things that help you. And in Denmark, they, the kids tell a story about some little things called gremlins. And, and these gremlins in Denmark have red hats. And they kind of look like ordinary elves. But part of them like to do mischief and, and, and make sport with people. And, and this is going to be a story about that kind of a grandma. It was early in the morning and a little boy was hurrying on his way to school. It was kind of late and, and it was a long way and his legs were pretty short. And so he just hurried as much as he could and he didn't look either right or left or behind him. And he had a great big backpack because uh, that's what he kept his stuff in. And he was in such a hurry that he had forgotten to close the clasp on the back of it. So as he ran, the back of his knapsack bounced up and down. And inside of it, his lunchbox and his pencil box and his books, his reading book, his arithmetic, they just kind of bounced against each other. But he wasn't even thinking about that. He was just hurrying as fast as he could to get to school. And guess who went tiptoeing just a little bit behind him? Yep, that little figure that was running behind the boy was that little gremlin with his big red hat. And the boy didn't even see him. And the gremlin wanted to have himself a nice adventure. And when he saw the boy's open knapsack, he got the idea that maybe he could hide inside of it. So he ran behind the boy just as fast as he could go, and he thought, ha, ha, ha. That knapsack is open. It's going to be easy for me to get in there. And just about the time the little boy jumped over a rock, the gremlin also jumped and hopped right inside the knapsack. Boy, this knapsack's starting to feel heavy, the boy thought, but since most of his thoughts were just on getting to school and and how late it was, and how far it was, he, he didn't think too much about how heavy the knapsack was. And, and the 
grandmother was thinking, boy, this is a good place for me to ride. But it's not very comfortable yet. It's, it's too tight in here. Well, I know what I'm going to do about that. So he grabbed the boy's lunch sack, lunch pail, and he ate all the food inside of it, and then he threw the knapsack away. Well, that helps a little, he thought, but I can make it even better. So he took the boy's pencil box, and he threw that out along the path. And then he threw out the reading book. Ah, there's nothing new in there, he said, and he threw it away. And then he came to the arithmetic book and, and the tablet. And, and after he'd thrown them away, he was very happy, and very comfortable. And the boy didn't even notice how much lighter his knapsack was. He, all he was thinking of was how late it was and how he had to hurry to get to school on time. Well, the boy went so fast that he got to school on time. And he went inside the school and he hung his knapsack up in the cloakroom. And then he ran out in the playground with all the other kids. And, and after a few minutes, the gremlin hopped down under the floor and ran and hid in the darkest corner of the schoolroom. Pretty soon the kids came in and the grandma had never before seen so many kids together at one time because little gremlins don't go to school. The teacher says, okay now, lift up your books. And that boy found out then that his knapsack was empty. He couldn't find his book, or his pens and pencils, or his lunchbox, and he cried. And the grandma laughed, standing there hidden in the corner. And that's how the day began. Then when the children were very busy reading, the gremlin sneaked out of his corner. He climbed under the table because the kids were all sitting around a table. At least four kids were sitting around the same table. And he sneaked among their feet. And while he was walking around there by the kids' feet, one of them accidentally kind of bumped him in the nose. And that made the gremlin very angry. squeezed the boy's shoe. Ow! Oh, the kid hollered. Because gremlins can really squeeze hard when they want to squeeze. The teacher said, quiet! So the kids were quiet for a while. Until one of them accidentally kicked the gremlin in the nose again. And the gremlin squeezed that kid on the shoe real hard. And the kid hollered, Aah! And the teacher said, Quiet! And then the gremlin got thinking, Hey, this is kind of fun to go around squeezing the boys on their toes. So he sneaked around underneath the table and kept on squeezing here and there everybody's toes. Cut it out, screamed one of the kids. And they, they all looked at each other and, and, and blamed each other. And so the teacher said, well, I better go down and see what's going on. What's the matter with those kids? And when the teacher started coming, then the gremlin ran and hid in the corner again. And nobody saw him. Well, then it was time for recess. And so all the kids went outside to play. and. The gremlin came out of his hiding place and decided he'd find some other thing that was fun to do and mischievous. 
So he climbed up on the table and he opened all of the kids' knapsacks and he took out their books and all their other things and he put them back, but in the wrong knapsacks. He changed everything around so that nothing was the same as it was before. Well, then the kids came back in and it was time for them to read and write, so they took their things out of their book, but they were all mixed up. And the kids started fighting with each other and saying, give me back my stuff. And it took a long, long time before finally everybody had everything back where it should be. And, and inside one of the dark corners, the gremlin just stood and laughed and laughed and thought he was pretty clever. And he felt very safe because nobody would ever guess that there was a gremlin there. But the teacher was pretty wise, and she said, it must be a gremlin who's mixed up everything, and we've got to catch him. And so they started searching, they chased all over the room, and the gremlin had to run about, and he, he ran just as fast as a little mouse. But pretty soon, one of the kids saw him, and they were really after him. Well, finally, he sneaked back out into the coat room, and he jumped up into the arms of one of the coats, which was just kind of hanging down, and, and he thought he was safe. But he forgot about his hat. Remember, he had a real red, tall hat, like gremlins wear? Well, it stuck up out of the arm of the coat, and one of the boys saw it, and so they captured the gremlin. They made him tell everything about how he jumped in the back of the boy's knapsack and got into the school and how he had squeezed the kid's toes and how he mixed up all of their things. And so the kids were pretty angry at him. And, and they asked the teachers, can, can we lock him up and keep him a prisoner? Well, the teacher said, we could lock him in my empty hen house. And we'll just keep him there and we won't feed him anything but bread and water until he's sorry for all the mischief that he did to us. So the kids locked him back up in a knapsack and they took him away to the teacher's hen house. But when they took him out, he was completely still. He didn't move. And the kid says, oh, he died of fright, the poor little thing. And the kids were very sad. And they laid him down on the grass very gently. And they forgot all about how angry they had been with him just a few minutes before. <laughs> Jumped the gremlin and he got up real quick and he ran away as fast as he could. And just in a second he had disappeared. And finally the kids understood that he had fooled them. He wasn't dead or, or even hurt at all. He was just playing possum just to fool those kids so they let him loose. Well, he got away in the forest and he clapped his hands because he had had a very good adventure and it ended up okay too. It was fun to be in school, he thought, and to play with the kids. I think I'll do that again sometime. He laughed and he laughed. But after that time, all of those school kids that went to that school were very careful to close their knapsacks and, and, and their school boxes and so forth. Because nobody wants to let a gremlin get back into the schoolroom again. But sometimes I think gremlins sneak into schoolrooms all over the place and then things get all mixed up and they go terrible. Do you think that in your school room or, or maybe even in your house Sometimes a gremlin gets in there and makes things get lost and get mixed up and makes your room dirty and stuff like that. 
I think they do because sometimes there's a gremlin or something that gets in Grandpa's house and makes those things happen. Now I'd like to tell you a, a Christmas story about a Christmas angel. Once upon a time there was a little princess named Theodosia. One morning she woke up very early. She laid in her soft bed and, and she heard the chiming of bells. She clapped her hands and said, Oh, how, I, how glad I am. I know what the bells are saying. It's Christmas morning. She was so eager that she forgot to say her prayers. She forgot to say good morning to the king or father or the queen or mother. She just slipped out of bed and ran barefoot down the marble stairs into the great palace drawing rooms to find what gifts the Christmas had brought her. She pushed open the heavy door and she heard a sound that kind of heard like the rustling of wings. It scared her for a minute, but then the Christmas bells rang again very clearly and, and she wasn't afraid of anymore. And she went inside the hall and she saw a beautiful sight. It wasn't day yet. But there was a soft light in the big room that seemed to come from a great white pearl that was hanging from the ceiling. And Theodosia thought, oh, I, I wish that all my presents were pearls. And then she looked again and saw all around that great big hall tablets with golden letters. And each letter had a name. It was a king's name, the queen's name, and the name of everybody in that royal household. And under each name was a great big pile of gifts. She couldn't hardly see her own name. It was at the other end of the hall. So she ran toward it and said to herself, I don't care what the other folks are going to have. I want to see my pretty gifts. And finally she found a tablet that had her name on it. And there was nothing under it. Just a, le a black leather bag. And on the bag it was written, This is for the selfish Theodosia. But she thought it might have something in it that was beautiful for her, so she lifted it up from the floor. It was locked. There was no key. All she found was another inscription engraved in small, fine letters, right on the lock. And it said, I am worth much to him who can open me. The poor little princess snapped her bare feet on the cold floor. She was just about ready to cry. She was so frustrated, but she was too proud to cry. And then she noticed one of the mirrors that a handsome boy angel was standing behind her. And she wasn't afraid, because even in the mirror she could see that it was a very gentle and kind angel. His clothes were white as the snow, and his face was very fair and beautiful as beautiful as any dream you ever had. And when she saw how soft and clear his eyes were, she was very calm and she didn't feel angry about the frustrations he had before. And she turned to him and, and right away and said, I know who you are. You're the Christmas angel. And just at that moment, she noticed that that great pearl wasn't hanging from the ceiling anymore. It shone right out over that angel's head, or maybe around that angel's head. And, and when he smiled, he had a smile that looked like sunshine. But then he stopped smiling and looked very sad. And he said, you poor child, you do not know the secret that unlocks all treasures, but if you will come with me, find somebody who can help us and tell us. He held out his hand and Theodosia put her hand in it because she wasn't afraid of him. And they went 
out of the palace of the great white world. And it seemed to Theodosia that while the angel was holding her hand, her feet barely touched the ground. And in the other hand, she was still holding that mysterious bag. And every once in a while, she looked up at the beautiful face of the angel. And over his head, that great pearl just shined like a star. They went through very quiet streets of the town, and there weren't many people around. And as they walked, the angel began to tell her the old sweet story of the very first Christmas day and of the Christmas gift of the child Jesus, which dear God had made to the world he loved. He told how the kings and wise men came from far countries with rich offerings in their hands, and how the angels sang for joy. Theodosia looked up and said timidly, Were you there? The angel seemed to be looking at some fair vision a long way off as he said low and sweetly, Yes, I was there. Then the angel went on to tell how lovely was the child Jesus so that all who looked upon him loved him and began to love one another also. And then he said, Little Theodosia, do you know the meaning of Christmas? Theodosia was silent. Then she got her nerve up and she said, I know it means that Jesus was born into the world. And then the Christmas bell sounded and sounded and seemed to say, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And by and by the angel stopped at a very small cottage and he opened the door and they went into a little tiny room. But nobody could see him. The angel had covered Theodosia with his robe, and so nobody could see him. There was a little candle burning on the table, and a very sickly looking woman sat by. She was sewing on, on, a, on a piece of cloth. She had gotten up very early on that day just to do that work. And there was a little boy who had just gotten out of a very rough, small bit in the corner, and he was trying to light a small fire with, with chips of wood that he had picked up in the street. And he was crying kind of quietly because he was very cold and very hungry. And the poor a mother who looked very, very sick and very, very pale raised her high eyes to heaven and she was praying, praying over and over again, give us this day our daily bread. And Theodosia, who lived in a palace all her life, had never seen such misery, and all of the troubles that she'd ever had suddenly seemed very small, and she said to herself, oh, why can't I do something to help these poor people? And she couldn't bear to wait till she could ask her father, the king, to help them. Just then she looked down and was very surprised to see that that bag had opened up all by itself and inside of it there was a whole bunch of silver money. And she was afraid it might shut again, so she reached out and she grabbed a handful of money and she scattered it all over the room. But the silver never fell to the floor. It just seemed to vanish in midair. But suddenly a bright fire appeared in the fireplace. And suddenly on the table there was a whole bunch of food, and the little boy and his mother said thank you to God and blessed whoever it was that brought them that food and that nice warm fire. And then the angel led Theodosia away, and she heard the Christmas bells saying something from the Bible. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was hungry and you gave me food, and you did it for me. By now it was day, and Theodosia and the angel found themselves in another part of the city. There were all kinds of little kids in the, in the room. They had scraps of newspaper and a couple of books, and, and they were just learning to read. And in the middle of them, there was a teacher. 
she was just a poor young girl, but she was being their teacher. And every morning, she came around and taught the kids in the neighborhood before she went to do her work in the factory. And she did this just because she wanted those kids to have a chance to go to school. And she said, now kids, let's go through our lesson quickly. Then we will go and have a Christmas holiday and look at all the fine things in the stores and the pretty ladies on the street. And who knows, maybe the king and the queen and the princess will ride by. When Theodosia heard that, she thought, Oh, I wish I could help these little ones. They have no pleasures but just to look at the pleasure of other people. And suddenly, the bag opened up again, and she saw there was some gold in it. And for a moment, she thought, Wow, with this gold, I could buy myself a beautiful necklace of pearls, just like I always wanted. And then the bag began to shut again, Theodosia took one look at the kids and thought very quickly and then she reached into the bag and she took out all of the gold and she scattered it through the room. And by magic, the room became very beautiful. And now it was a beautiful school room. And the kids were putting up wreaths. And the teacher wasn't a poor factory girl anymore. Now she was a fair, very gentle woman and she had a whole bunch of Christmas gifts to give to the children. And Theodosia wished that she could stay and watch but the angel took her away again. And when they were out in the street again the angel said, do you know the secret now? Theodosia didn't answer but she heard the Christmas bells and they were saying, not what we get but what we give makes up our treasure while we live. This time the angel lifted her from the earth and carried her swiftly over the whole country and over many and many other lands. And she saw how many people there were who did not yet know what Christmas meant. Yet there are thousands and thousands of kids who never heard of Christ. But Theodosia felt very good now she just was full of Christmas love and it made her very sad to think that there was so much sadness in the world. And then she put her hand on the lock of the bag again and said, if there is any more magical money in here, I want to throw it down on this poor, unhappy, wicked world. And the bag opened very easily there was nothing in it except a magnificent necklace of pearls. She looked for some silver gold, but she couldn't find it. And there was a necklace just like what she always wanted, but she realized that the pearls was the only thing there, and she had to give them up, or else she couldn't give anything to the people of the world. So she flung that necklace of beautiful pearls down onto the earth and the necklace broke up and the pearls scattered far and wide and every place that a pearl fell a church rose up or a beautiful school and all over when those things happened people were very very happy and the angel said to her now see your bag is empty aren't you sorry but Theodosia looked straight into the kind eyes of the angel and she said I know the secret now and the Christmas bells rang out it is more blessed to give than to receive and the angel gave her a great big hug and they flew back through the air back to the palace of the king and into that hall where all the presents were king and the queen hadn't come yet, and the angel carried Theodosia to the place where her name was, and by golly, there was that black bag again. Now it was wide open and full of many, many gifts, and each gift had something written on it. 
there was a beautiful bouquet of flowers and it said these are the prayers of the poor and there was a crystal goblet that said the disciples award but most of all was the necklace of pearls that hung from the tablet and every pearl had a name like patience and gentleness and truth and innocence and the very biggest pearl that was there just like the one that Theodosia had seen on the angel's brow and on it was written the greatest of all things is charity and that's how she learned the name of the Christmas angel the Christmas angel is called charity and she also thought why that black bag is just like my heart. When it's closed to charity, it's poor and empty. But when it's opened up for others, it gets richer in treasure all the time. And then she heard the Christmas bells again. And Theodosia was very happy because now she knew what Christmas was. It was more than just getting gifts for yourself it was giving things to other people too. And after that, Theodosia loved Christmas more than she ever had before. Now it's the end of the tape. I hope you kids enjoy it, and I hope you can play it more than just once. Bye-bye, sweethearts.